Steen here at the Paris School of International Affairs at Sciences Po. And it's my great pleasure to welcome you to this morning's event um, relating to building coalitions between France and Germany in Europe and the world. And we're absolutely delighted to have Jorge uh, Cookies uh, with us this morning. Um, we'll introduce him in a moment. I just wanted to first say that uh, this is an event which is being run jointly with the Jacques Delors Institute um, as part of a series, the the Pariser Platz Dialogue series between uh, German Franco uh, senior leaders. Um, and to this effect, I'd like to introduce uh, immediately Johannes Linder, who is the director of the, uh, um, the Jacques Delors Institute in Berlin, um, who's going to introduce uh, Mr. Cookies and we'll start this event immediately. And welcome to all of you who are joining us online as well. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, and I'm, I'm extremely pleased uh, that uh, of your patience, as I said to the people here in the audience already, but wasn't uh, fully um, possible for the listeners to hear me. Uh, this is between because of the industrial action here in Paris. We had to uh, start a bit later, and, but I'm particularly happy that you made it, That particularly happy that we have Jörg Cookies with us. And indeed, this is uh, an event that we are doing here, um, uh, the Jacques Delors Center together with Sciences Po. And let me just say two words. First of all, a, a quick thank you to the Foreign Office who is supporting this event, the German Foreign Office. And also a short moment, this is the first time that we're doing an event in Sciences Po as part of the Pariser Platz Dialogue. And a former uh, student and a key facilitator uh, uh, of Franco-German relations, Henrik Enderlein, a former student of, of, uh, uh, of Sciences Po, would have probably really liked that fact that we're doing this now for the first time here in Sciences Po. Unfortunately, he passed away two years ago and our memory uh, of him are still very vivid. So um, with this, I would go straight to, to Jörg. Um, it's, it's great to have you here. I don't think you need an introduction. Often one says uh, uh, people don't need an introduction, but I think Jörg Cook is, is known. He's the trusted uh, advisor to the, to the Chancellor on European and economic uh, issues. The Chancellor Olaf Scholz had him with, uh, had, uh, had, you, had, whole, had put, brought you in from Goldman when he became finance minister and you were state secretary at the finance ministry already with him. Now, um, we would like to speak to you about uh, the priorities uh, of Germany for the EU and the globe, and also on Franco-German relations. And of course, the war in Ukraine has really turned uh, global relations upside down. Uh, Olaf Scholz has described it as Zeitenwende, Zeitenwende, turning point. And it has a descriptive element really describing this huge watershed that we've seen uh, since the war in Ukraine but it also has a strategic dimension. And I think people in particular here in Paris are wondering what precisely is the strategic dimension of Zeitenwende and also what does it mean for the Franco-German relations? Um, and uh, of course the Franco-German relations are not a means to an end uh, alone, but, uh, but they are also, uh, um, they're not, they're a means to an end and not uh, uh, kind of relevant in itself. Um, because as an engine for European stability, Franco-German have uh, proven to be very important. Mm -hmm. And so the two questions to you, what are the implications of Zeitenwende for the priority and the role of Germany in Europe? And also what uh, do you make of the criticism uh, or description that um, Franco-German relations are perceived as being in a bit of a rocky uh, state at the moment? And with this, I hand over. Thank you very much. Or well, you can take this. Okay. Okay, thank you. And apologies for being late. It took more than two hours from uh, Charles de Gaulle Airport to here. So uh, <laughs> was not uh, anticipated. I should have taken the moto taxi. Um, so I think the the discussion around Franco-German relationships is far exaggerated. If you read the text of the um, of the communique that we signed um, to commemorate the 60th um, anniversary of the um, Elysee Treaty, I think you can see that the depth and the strength of the relationship were doing um, a lot more. And uh, we've had so many exchanges. Uh, the first visit that the Chancellor made was to Paris, and the interactions between President Macron and Chancellor Olaf Scholz has, I can't even count them. And there have been so many, I don't think uh, there has been any interaction with any head of state and government that's been more frequent um, than, um, than the dialogue between the chancellor and the president. So I'm um, absolutely convinced that uh, that there is a lot of strength. Um, I'm 
heading to the Elysee after this. So at all levels, there's an extremely intense dialogue and um, an exchange. Of course, there's differences in views, but um, in both of my, in all three of my recent roles as a student, as a uh, professional in the private sector and in politics, there's always been discussions and there's always been disagreements um, on individual topics, but that has never distracted from detracted from finding an outcome at the end. If you see during the last year, and that goes to the to the first question, um, the 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 phenomenon of Zeitenwende is not something that is only German. If I look at the the decisiveness with which Germany and France acted together in the European Union, in the G7, in the G20, the, the dialogue and the, the coordination between Germany and France and all of those international fora has been extremely intense and successful. Um, if you think about it from the fact that um, that uh, within three days after the Russian invasion of Ukraine, we were able to freeze 300 billion of Russian assets. Um, nobody expected that. We were very decisive in all of the in all of the um, responses in terms of sanctions, in terms of providing military and financial support to the Ukraine. All of these have been decided in consensus at the European level, at the global level, um, in the G7. Um, we even managed um, to get a strong condemnation of Russia's war of aggression in the G20 together. None of that would have been possible if Germany and France hadn't uh, fully agreed on it. Last but not least, I think what's extremely important is that, that despite disagreements in some individual areas, which I find quite natural and which also exist between Germany and Italy and France and Spain, where, the, where we don't always agree on everything either, um, the facts speak for themselves in terms of mutual support. France helped Germany tremendously by increasing its capacity to export gas. Um, after Putin curtailed the gas from uh, through Nord Stream, Germany helped in France when the nuclear power was low through exporting electricity. Usually it's the other way around. Usually fr France helps us. So in that sense, you can see that all of the practical adjustments that were made, both in the big geostrategic um, um, area of, of uh, responding to Russians' aggression, aggression, but also in the pragmatic daily questions like um, energy exchange, the, the the pragmatism through which we've achieved results very quickly really helped both countries. Could, could we zoom in nevertheless on maybe two aspects where at least from the outside, the, the perception is that Franco-German is not as, uh, as, as positive or as, as consensual as you painted. Um, so the first would be on energy. I mean, the, the differences in view on nuclear, and we remember the discussion on, on taxonomy, uh, also the question of now hydrogen from nuclear, where you have the impression that there is still a fundamental difference in national choices and that stand between the two countries. And uh, the second is the point on security. Do you think uh, that, uh, I mean, and I, here I could again also give you an example, I mean, the F-35 uh, uh, procurement by the, by the Germans, the general sense that you, th that you get the impression that with the Germans wanting to spend 100 billion, that may and most likely bring them closer to uh, uh, the US and, and US uh, procurement and US uh, um, uh, arms and, and, and uh, uh, industry. So in that respect, I mean, these two elements on security and energy, would you, could you maybe spell out a little bit more how the impression that there has been fundamental choices and as a result, also some fundamental structural divergences between the two countries? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I, um, I uh, was an I was an étudiant à Paris en 1994, and there was already discussions around the different attitudes of Germany and France on le nucléaire. Right, so I fail to see that this is anything new at all. You know, like the the views in France positive on nuclear. I mean, how many demonstrations against nuclear was there um, in France? How many were there in Germany? Um, so this goes back decades, right? So this is nothing new, or it's just a difference in views. It's a difference in attitudes. So so you know, like, but but I don't. There is no. There has not not been any change in that difference. 
Um, if you see what the difference in response to the Fukushima disaster was, it was also fundamentally different. And that's more than 10 years ago. So this is, you know, this is, it's been there, yes, and it is still a difference. And of course, it leads to debates between Germany and France on policy, on the definition of green hydrogen, on many things on the renewable energy directive but this is not new this has been the case for decades and it probably will be the case for decades in the future because our countries are moving in different directions on energy um you can now say the glass is half empty because that leads to conflict and dialogue and and discussions and differences in views in european um legislative processes see the renewable energy directive the the delegated act to implement that yes true um but I would counter that by saying, A, it's nothing new at all. These discussions have been there for decades. And second of all, if you think about it, it also adds a positive element of diversification of our sources of energy. I mean, Germany is going into a massive build out of generating electricity through wind and solar. Um, France is as well, but of course, because of the the additional um, um, fact that we are going out of nuclear and France is increasing nuclear, of course, we have to be more ambitious on wind and solar, um, just in terms of the sheer volumes, because the consumption of electricity is pretty similar um, um, in our economies. So what I'm saying is this also adds a diversification benefit, because um, if we succeed in building out our our renewable energy very substantially, then we can we can in, increase the interconnectivity of our, our electricity grids quite well <clears throat> because of situation arise such as the one in France in, in last summer. We can provide electricity um, if the wind isn't blowing and the sun is shining, we can import electricity. The fact is we are ex expanding the interconnectivity between the electricity systems of Germany and France and Germany and Belgium and France and Belgium um, by about 50% so that we can benefit from each other. And the fact that different sources of energy are being chosen also means that there is a diversification benefit. So in that sense, I wouldn't see it as negatively as you do. The same is on, on the military questions. So first of all, the 22nd of January was a big day because we agreed on the exact um, composition of the FCAS, the future combat air system. So that is now a project that Germany and France are driving forward together. And that's the key point on a lot of the key questions. And as you can see in the um, in the very successful, fortunately very successful defense of Ukraine against Russian aggression, exactly the the points in FCAS are the are some of the most relevant ones, namely defense electronics. Um, how you can use the cloud to defend yourself and all of these things will be very important. So the fact that Germany and France are strategically working together in this area, I would see as a positive sign. The fact that Germany took a decision to order military devices from the US, F-35s is correct. In terms of the availability, we didn't have an alternative because the aircraft that are providing for our nuclear protection will be out of service in the very near foreseeable future. The time that it takes us in the most optimistic scenario to have the first aircraft from the Franco-German project FCAS available will be longer than that. So we need a solution in the interim. And fact of the matter is the US with their 800 billion defense budget have a much more industrialized process, um, production process of military aircraft. So they had the F-35s available relatively quickly. So that was a pure, pure procurement process. And this will continue. I mean, the, 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 I will not make any kind of statement, and I don't think anyone will make any kind of statement that we will only buy European military equipment in the next 20 years. I mean, the US is an extremely important NATO partner. So the fact that there is exchange and that there is cooperation on military um, on military um, and devices between our countries and the US is something very natural and very normal. It happens in helicopters, it happens in tanks, it happens in aircraft. So I don't think that's anything um, nearly as dramatic as it's uh, sometimes uh, made out to be. The key point, the cooperation between Germany and France in many military areas is very strong.
I'm, I'm sure we we're we're getting back to this when I open up to the audience. Uh, can I maybe before doing so also pull you a bit further into your vision for for the European Union, and that's linked to what you said. Martin Wolf yesterday had a very nice opinion piece in the Financial Times. You may have seen it, and there he he said, "Okay, Europe has to decide." And he said it also against the background of uh, China US tensions, uh, has to decide what role it wants to play in this architecture, the global architecture in, in, a, in a world that has really changed. And he desc describes sort of three potential roles. One is uh, an ally, he says, uh, maybe a subservient ally to the US. One is a bridge, uh, trying to be, be remaining a global standard setter and trying to influence the global debate. And the last one is a, a power power in itself and he says probably from a european perspective the power would be the most uh the most desirable one but he says that has implication in terms of fiscal union and political union where he's not sure uh the the current decision makers are ready to take that step what would you see the strategy of olaf schultz on that well i mean first of all i i think in these crises we have seen very important steps towards more intensive cooperation also on the fiscal side. Um, if you look at the 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 origin of next generation EU, which I think was in terms of response to the Corona crisis, very comparable to what the United States did as a federal um, as a federal state with a complete fiscal union. Um, the fact that we were able to respond fairly quickly, um, within a few months. The U.S., it also takes some time to make legislative decisions, as we've seen in many instances, and it's not always peace and harmony there either, um, has been comparable in terms of a uh, fraction of fiscal expenditure relative to GDP, effectiveness, um, the cohesion aspect, meaning that more affected regions were, um, were supported much more stronger than those less affected. Um, so I would say that was a a, a, a sign of evidence that Europe can find together in fiscally important areas. If you look at the support for the fiscal support for the Ukraine, um, the US and Europe has been very, very similar in their responses. And the European Union, despite the, the fact that we need unanimity among the 27, um, has already rolled out an 18 billion support program for Ukraine for macro financial assistance. So what I'm saying is, um, on all of these on all of these areas, whether it's next generation EU, whether it's the um, the sure instrument for unemployment um, insurance and support for qualification, whether it's the Ukraine support, whether it's uh, repower EU with channeling hundreds of billions of euros into um, into promoting the European energy market and making sure that it works together and is an, is a real internal market for for electricity and um, and renewable energy and and gas and all sources of of energy that we have also for nuclear. Um, in all of these, you can find tons and tons of examples where, despite all of the intense debates, we found together and resolved the conflicts and found a solution. I'm sure there are questions on this. So thank you very much. Let's now open up uh, to the audience and I'm encouraging you uh, to come forward. I'll, uh, there is, um, uh, exactly, you have the microphone. Maybe we start here and then we go, go over. Hi, good morning, Vincent Collin with Les Echos, the French business newspaper. Uh, you talked a bit about hydrogen. Could you um, get a little more into detail on the negotiation that's going on between uh, the 27 European countries uh, in Brussels on this? What exactly mm -hmm. are Germany's uh, uh, red lines? I'm thinking uh, particularly on the uh, Red 3 uh, directive, but more generally, um, okay. where can... What are Germany's red lines and what do you think a compromise could be with France and the uh, the other uh, nuclear countries? Let's, let, let's maybe have a few. So. Hello, um, Laura Bauschke. I'm a student at Sciences Po. Um, I have a question that's maybe more related to the German domestic politics. So I think last week we saw that the Liberal Party blocked Germany's vote in the EU. So um, as a future policymaker, I would like to know what are your strategies to kind of ensuring that, yeah, with very two opposing parties, you kind of find consensus. 
Very good question. Thank you very much. Maybe Sebastian, and then for the next round, we go hit this way. Okay. Um, yes, uh, Sebastian Mayal, head of the Factor uh, Institute here in Paris. Uh, and thank you for the Paris Plus dialogue for doing this much needed uh, event. Um, my question is not so much on Franco German uh, dialogue, but uh, a, a truly European one. Uh, the European construction is, has always been based on, on uh, trust between member states and uh, it's a legal uh, structure. And the decision process is when an agreement is found is usually not re-questioned. Now, what kind of signal Germany is sending when an agreement has been found? And of course, uh, having in mind the one on the, the engine ban uh, for 2035, uh, when it is re-questioning an agreement that has been uh, settled uh, under the French presidency and now it has re-questioning, I think it's uh, perhaps uh, um, uh, dangerous for even for the for the, the way we handle uh, agreements in, uh, in and want to move on uh, for the EU. Thank you. Should I start? Okay. So on on H two, I think the 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 answer to your question is in the statement that President Macron and uh, Chancellor Olaf Scholz um, published on the twenty second of January here in Paris. It says very clearly that in the definition of hydrogen, we will accept all sorts of low carbon energy um, with relationship to the decarbonization targets of the European Union, but maintain our ambition level re relative to the renewable targets. And that is statement and communique language for basically saying that Germany took a very large step by saying that with low, low, low carbon, everyone knows is meant nuclear. We will accept and acknowledge and not oppose the contribution that nuclear energy can make towards fulfilling decarbonization targets. However, what we don't accept is a reduction in the ambition level on renewables targets. So for example, to make it more technical and apologies to those who aren't as, um, as, um, as into um, the renewables energy directive, but the, the question was very precise. Um, what Germany doesn't find reasonable, and this is by the way, an agreement in council, even under the French, that was reached under the French presidency, is low carbon energy does not count equivalent and equal to a renewable energy source. So it doesn't count towards the renewable targets. But when we are talking about decarbonization targets more generally, um, Germany, for example, will import hydrogen made from, from nuclear energy. We will not try to um, erect barriers or find any rules that prohibit the the um, or discriminate against hydrogen made from nuclear power. So in that sense, it's a it's a um, bit of a dichotomy there, but I think it's a very convincing one because the the idea behind it is we nobody wants a complete concentration of only one energy source and. The European Union has agreed on ambitious targets to build out renewable energies, i.e. wind and solar and other renewable energies, um, and we do not want to sacrifice that going forward. On the end point of the combustion engine in 2035, um, we've spent the last several days, um, especially the, the transportation ministers, um, and the and um, the Commission have spent a large amount of work in the last few days on finding solutions to the open question. There are open questions. Yes, the German transport minister has made that very clear that he um, requests or in the context of the agreement that has been made and that he honors, the Commission clarifies the famous recital 11. Um, which says verbatim um, that after a stakeholder process, the commission will make proposals um, regarding um, regarding um, e-fuels, essentially. And it's a little bit of a simplification, but uh, but I think that's uh, that's okay. So nobody 
questions in principle the agreement found, but um, due to some lack of clarity, um, the, the German transport minister has asked the commission to clarify how exactly this self-commitment that the commission made in the recital and that everyone report, supports and that everyone thinks is correct, um, how exactly that is to be implemented. And hopefully we can find a solution to that and then move on because I do think, as you said, the, the adherence to commitments um, is something that needs to be honored, but it also needs to be honored by all sides and the commission and the relevant ministers are in very, very intense discussions to find solutions to satisfy both sides' needs. But first of all, I want to say hi to Arancha. It's very, it's great that uh, that you have arrived. So uh, super to have you here. And uh, also you you were in, in innovative in the way of coming here. So it's good to see you. Uh, now, can I nevertheless, and I'll open up for the next round, but I cannot nevertheless, because for the Parisian audience, I think it's important to understand a bit the dynamics in this three-party coalition. And uh, and I'm characterizing a bit uh, maybe, but there are observers that feel Lindner, who is under, and not, not, not me. Uh, <laughs> so Lindner, Lindner is under enormous pressure. Uh, he's been losing regional election and he has no capital, political capital to spare on Europe. And so if you go through this episode, which is not Lindner, but Wissing, but his party, you go to fiscal rules, you look at the sovereignty fund, it's particularly the finance minister and the liberal parties that have a different view than, say, the Greens and the SPD. I mean, you're advisor to the chancellor, you don't need to uh, give us the full spiel of, of what coalition government means at the current juncture, but how would you respond to this, that it seems that there is no clear unity within the coalition and that one um one coalition partner sets the lowest common denominators tune on europe well first of all i mean everyone who reads the electoral platforms of the parties forming the german coalition know that there's differences in approaches on this question so again i would say this is not um spectacularly new or this this is nothing that uh, that has come up recently so th this is this is normal politics, and when I read about differences in views in the French Parliament, or in when I'm we were in the U.S. Um, and talked to several senators and representatives, even within the Democratic Party, there's different views within the Republican Party. So this is not. I, I wouldn't say that this is spectacular that there's differences in views, nor is it um, terribly new. And the coalition agreement finds a good compromise on fiscal. The German government has a position, so we have um, we have given input to the Commission on the proposals on the Stability and Growth Pact, um, which is completely consensualized within the German government, which is a constructive view, but also a critical view because we don't think that the Commission has fully thought through all consequences of a complete bilateralization of implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact on the future of a true fiscal union. And we do say that um, we think also from the idea and the conceptual um, um, conviction that we have of moving in the direction of a fiscal union, a complete bilateralization of the enforcement and the implementation of the Stability and Growth Pact is actually um, somewhat counterproductive to the idea of common rules. So that we think getting rid of the common rules with the with the structural deficit and the things that we all commit to adhere to um, would actually be a step in the wrong direction rather than a good direction. Um, but again, this is a position that that um, everyone um, agrees on. And for example, the the Liberal Party has made a very substantial move um, up until not that long ago. The famous Maastricht criteria of 60% debt to GDP and uh, a convergence rate of 1 20th per year to the 60% target has been a very strong um, um, negotiating position all along. Um, and as you've seen, the German government is now willing to discuss the question of the convergence rate to the 60%. And Christian Lindner has agreed to that. And the other parties have also agreed to that. That is a huge step forward. The problem is, um, we have the impression that 
whenever we make a step forward, it's not necessarily responded to by taking seriously the 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 red lines that we also have. Maybe we do the next round, and I have passed on the the moderation role to Anna Anchen. So we're gonna take uh, just one, and then we'll the lady. <laughs> Um, hi, thank you so much. My name is Susanna Goetz and I study environmental policy here at Sciences Po. So I have to ask you about climate action. And it worries me a little bit it hasn't come up yet because I do see France and Germany together as leaders in Europe and in the world being such powerful and rich countries, to be honest, as leaders in the transition toward net zero. Um, however, I think the policy action since the war in Ukraine started has shown us that radical transition is possible, but we're doing it, especially the energy transition, under the headline of independency from Russia, rather than the journey toward net zero. So I wonder, why is it not possible to be so radical in the climate realm, especially seeing as both France and Germany, all the leaders, as far as I'm concerned, agree that climate change is the biggest threat and the biggest thing we have to tackle in this century, and that we're the last people who could um, so why couldn't the French-German alliance really get together and tackle this with aggressive and innovative policymaking? I would say we are radical and we are aggressive. If you look at I the, disagree. If, yeah, but uh, let me try to convince you. <laughs> if you. If you look at the pieces of legislation that we passed in Germany, Wind auf See Gesetz, Wind an Land Gesetz, and Erneuerbare Energien Gesetz, which is the legislation covering the offshore wind, the onshore wind, and all renewable energy. We are going in offshore wind from 7.8 gigawatts of installed capacity to 30 gigawatts. We are going from 50, until 2030. We are going from 58 gigawatts of installed capacity on onshore to 115. We are going from 70 to 200 in solar, all in the next seven years. If you think about what that means, um, we have declared renewable energies in our overarching public interest and in our national security interest. We are, as we speak, auctioning seven gigawatts of offshore wind capacity in the North and uh, Baltic Sea as we speak as a first step this year. Um, we are auctioning 10 gigawatts of onshore per annum in the next years to satisfy those goals. If you think about the fact that one gigawatt of offshore capacity um, is enough electricity for 1 million households, the fact that we are going from 30 to 45 in, in 2035 to 70 gigawatts in 2045, if that's not radical, I don't know what is radical. The companies that I was just at an energy conference in in Houston, um, where all of the all of the fossil companies are thinking about how they become ESG compatible, they are saying there is no program in the world that is as fast and aggressive as the German program. And there's quite a lot of industrialists who tell us that the supply of rotors of all of the things that we need to build 30 gigawatts of onshore, offshore and 110 gigawatts of onshore by 2030 is simply not doable from an industrial perspective because there's not enough industrial capacity in these sectors. We respond by saying, this is where the market economy can now prove its efficiency. And if you look at the price movement of the, the those companies that are involved in in helping us to do this, this radical change in the composition of our electricity mix, um, you can see that the market is already anticipating it and allocating quite a lot of capital into those um, companies who are producing the, the, the transmission grids, the rotors, and all of the things that we need to build this out. Um, but what I'm saying is we are already stretching the system to the limit. Um, so in that sense, Apologies for a bit of a technical response to the question, but I do think the numbers show that the ambition level is much higher than you think. Of course, Lutzerath and keeping a coal-fired power plant on stream 
constructing LNG terminals is a much more visible, much more tangible thing. And it was necessary in the short term because the European Union used to import 158 billion cubic meters of gas from Russia, and that almost entirely came to the standstill. And if you see what industrial importance that has for our countries, we needed a very, very fast response to compensate that. And unfortunately, the, 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 the way that we've neglected the radical change to renewables in the past means that the available capacity is only there in, in a very, very short term on renewables. But the fact that we are taking all of the concrete steps in terms of prioritizing, massively accelerating the planning, the permissioning, the implementation, both on the, the um, sources of energy and the transmission of energy, means that we're very serious about two things. 80% of our electricity will be renewable in 2030. 100% of our electricity will be renewable in 2035. And I think that's pretty radical. I'm going to go to uh, Sylvie, and then we're going to take a question uh, from the public online. But I couldn't resist, John. How will Europe? Uh, I, I'm just back from the US, so excuse me for bringing a bit of a ghost into this conversation about energy. How will Europe fight against uh, unfair practices on the US side uh, that that have an impact mm. on our ability to do the transition, but also support uh, our industry? So, first of all, I have a bit of a split view on what the U.S. is doing. Because, first of all, I think it's enormously positive that the U.S., which in its own evaluation has been lagging behind in the new renewable build-out and hasn't been radical, is now doing something very radical to promote the build-out of renewable energy, of green hydrogen, um, of low carbon energy, just like in France, um, um, and is actually getting billion, hundreds of billions of dollars serious about transforming its energy mix um, into the renewable space. I think that's a priori, that's a positive. That they're doing it with very localized production and all of those things is something that we are very, very seriously discussing with the US. Um, the number of 370 billion of support for the economy is nothing that shocks me. If I think about the fact that 750 billion euros is available through next generation EU to the European economy for energy and digital, which are the two main beneficiaries of next generation EU, it's not like the European Union is behind in terms of sheer quantities of fiscal expenditure, they both also have pretty similar time horizons. So I think we have the instruments there. Um, we've been a bit self-inflicting some wounds in terms of making the money available. Um, if I look at the simplicity and the transparency and the predictability with which fiscal instruments such as the Inflation Reduction Act go to the companies benefiting from them and compare that to the European Union, I think the US has shown us that they are quicker than we are. The average German company that I talked to, but also French company, takes between 12 months and 24 months from filing an application for an important project of common European interest to the money actually flowing. The tax credit, both investment tax credit and production tax credit system of the Inflation Reduction Act means there is no approval procedure. Basically, every company knows from day one, if I do project X, I get amount Y. Whereas the European Union undergoes, you know, a year, two years of approval process, and the companies don't know anything on whether they get anything or ev or the whole amount. And that leads to investment insecurity. And I think that's something that now the commission has made announcements that they're gonna accelerate all of these things. So hopefully we will make up for that. But I'm saying is the aspect of local production is something the US is doing that we are not doing. Local content rules does not exist in any of the European rules, although, 
Some do say that the CBAM, for example, is something very specific and very protectionist that the European Union is doing. Um, um, I'll just leave that uncommented. Um, but it's not like that we are completely innocent of doing things that are not completely free trade, um, to put it mildly. Um, but yes, the, the, the local content rules of the Inflation Reduction Act are also a problem for us which is why it's good that the commission is using the TTC to widen, hopefully widen the, dis, the, the definition of those eligible, eligible under free trade agreement um, exemption to get relief from the local content rules. I think that's a very important question. Sylvie? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Sylvie Kaufman, Le Monde uh, newspaper. Um, you mentioned earlier, uh, you described the Franco-German relationship as, you know, having natural disagreements and differences of view and strong enough to overcome those differences. And I think everybody can understand this. But what your many of your European partners are saying is that the engine is not working. Um, in bringing Europe forward, uh, there's no impulse. There's no common. There are no common initiatives. There's no. You're not bringing the dynamics that they, some of them would like you to to bring together. And if you look at the um, uh, debate on on the war in Ukraine, it's uh, uh, the Central and Eastern Europe which is uh, driving the debate. So, how do you feel about this changing dynamic? Do you do you think this is um, something now becoming more structural? And how how does the Franco-German relationship can adjust to this? Yes. So first of all, I think the impulses are very strong from Germany and France. I'll give you one example. Um, pretty much after the formation of the German government, um, Finance Minister Lindner and uh, Bruno Le Maire announced a cooperation between Germany, France on startup investments in the um, in the um, um, Elysee Treaty um, um, declaration that we made um, the 60 year anniversary. We proposed to broaden the Franco-German partnership on startup investing to all of Europe. And by now, several European countries have already joined, and it's not even two months ago. Um, and so, this concept of uh, of a German, Franco-German initiative going European on startup financing, which I think is sort of at the epicenter of the future um, um, of the ability of Europe uh, to um, to invest into the future, is broadening into Europe. So that's an example where I'm surprised that there's not much more hype about it because it's it can be a hugely um, innovative, um, very strong um, um, future oriented signal to to Europe. At the moment, all countries are doing these startup financing projects on their own, and they make no sense nationally because every venture capital investor that we give public um, co-funding to tells us, I don't have a mandate to invest in Germany. They don't have an investment mandate to invest in Belgium or in Denmark or in France or in any other country. They have either global mandates or they have European mandates. So Europeanizing this makes total sense. And this is a classic case of a Franco-German um, um, initiative. But more broadly, I can absolutely guarantee you that from my four years of work in the finance ministry and the one year plus work in the chancellery, all of the massive initiatives that we've taken to support Ukraine have at the epicenter been Franco-German initiatives. I mean, look at the finance that we've provided to the Ukraine in terms of macro financial assistance. The idea that we used to mobilize European money in the SURE program, in the Next Generation EU program, that all of that financial technology has been reused also to support the Ukraine. So in that sense, the fact that France and Germany have been completely aligned in this support is a huge signal. Another huge, I mean, project of global geostrategic importance is the membership of Ukraine in the European Union. I mean, I had the privilege of being on the train with 
Prime Minister Draghi, President Macron, and Chancellor Olaf Scholz to Kiev and in the garden of the presidential palace in Kiev when they announced the candidacy status of Ukraine together with the Romanian president, um, President Zelensky. But this initiative would not have happened without France and Germany agreeing that Moldova, Ukraine, and in pr perspectively, Georgia belong to the European Union. This is a hugely important strategic initiative that is being driven by France and Germany, of course, together with Italy, together with Romania, but that's a good thing. I'll give you another example. The revival of the accession of the Western Balkan countries into the European Union. I mean, I had the privilege of attending several meetings with the leaders of Northern Macedonia, very complicated situation, Bulgaria, very complicated situation with respect to Northern Macedonia. Just in, in the Munich Security Conference, I was able to attend the meeting between, on the one side, President Vucic and President Macron and Chancellor Olaf Scholz together, right? Very important. The same with the, the um, leader of, the, of, of Kosovo. They, they're doing this together. And that's, you know, if you, if you see the importance of the Western Balkans for the future of Europe, um, the fact that Germany and France are at the epicenter of making this happen and making it possible shows that the Franco-German connection in all of these enormously important strategic areas for the future of Europe is working. Another point, and I think that's also very important that we added that to the consensus in the um, in the um, German in the Franco-German declaration in January is institutional reform of the European Union as a consequence of broadening out beyond the 27 to the Western Balkans, to Ukraine, to uh, Moldova, prospectively um, um, Georgia. The fact that we are both willing to engage in institutional reform, expand majority voting in the European Council and all of the European decision-making um, groups is also an enormously important thing. So all of these examples, I think, show that sort of the the common perception um, that you're that you're explaining. If you look at it case by case, what are the really important topics for the future of Europe? France and Germany are working together enormously closely. We're going to go um, to a question online. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, two very straightforward questions from our online participants. Um, in the light of Putin's threat of using nuclear weapons, what is the current position of the German government towards the French proposal for a U European nuclear deterrence program? And the second question would be on the European Sky Shield initiatives. It also significantly relies on US technology. Would you see the need or possibility to include more European systems, such as the ones developed by France and Italy? Thank you. Yes. So, first of all, I'm not a military expert, so uh, I have to say I, I do a lot, but uh, security policy and uh, these very specific military questions are not my area of expertise, so please um, accept very general answers on these on these questions. Um, SkyShield is a lot about European technology. Um, and I think the the success that um, that uh, Ukraine has had in defending itself against aerial attacks from Russia would not have been possible without American technology, without Israeli technology, without French technology, without German technology. So the answer um, to the question are is a usage of European technology in all of these projects uh, realistic and desirable is unambiguously yes. But I would also say if we want the best technology to defend ourselves, we cannot afford to be only looking at European technology. We, um, we are all multilateralists. Um, so I think the, the fact that our industries, our research, our technologies are globalized means that to defend ourselves against threats that we, that we will, um, that we will um, be facing and that we're defending ourselves with a lot of investment, we need to buy the best in the world. Well, 
Thank you very much. I think uh, we have come to the end of this session. Um, what I can say is that you're, uh, you should come back because there is, uh, there is uh, still a lot of questions that have remained and answers. Thank you very much for being here with us. Uh, thank you also to the Jacques Delors Berlin for bringing the Paris and Platz uh, dialogue to Paris. I think it's opportune to do that. You've got a standing invitation to continue to do that. And York, thanks again uh, for your candid dialogue uh, with all of us today.